All right, thank you again. Uh, this late afternoon session here. I'll talk about a grim subject, death and natural evil. Um, this is a, an old problem in theology and philosophy, mostly theology. And it goes something like this. The premise is, the two premises are that God is omnipotent. That means God possesses all power that there is to possess. God is perfectly good. There is no evil in him at all. But the third premise is that there is real evil in this world. There is death and suffering. It really exists. That leads to, well, a few uncomfortable conclusions. Philosophically, something up here must be wrong. Uh, perhaps God is capable of stopping evil, but he won't, in which case he is actually not perfectly good. Or perhaps God wants to stop evil, but he cannot. He is incapable, in which case he is not really omnipotent. Uh, neither of those options, I think, are really Christian options because the premises about God are basic teachings of Scripture. God is good, God loves us, and God is all-powerful. So that leaves what I consider to be Christian options. One is that what we think is evil isn't really evil. Or, God is capable and wants to stop evil, but not yet. He has a plan in mind for allowing evil to exist for a short amount of time. And that is essentially the philosophical issue. But philosophically, this issue touches on basic issues of science, which is what we want to emphasize right now. So let's think about what we think of as evil. Is all pain evil? Wouldn't it be nice if you could feel no pain? Actually, no, that would be terrible, right? So if Adam had stuck his hand in a fire before the, the fall, I'm pretty convinced he would have yowled and hollered because it would have hurt. Because the pain there has a purpose. The pain is not to make Adam suffer. The pain is to warn him that you're going to damage yourself, right? So the pain has a function. So maybe what we can think about here as creationists or as Christians, maybe there's a way to think about death and suffering like that. Maybe death and suffering have an important role to play, and they're not really that evil after all. So here's one of my favorite examples from John Ray. John Ray is an early uh, scientist. He wrote this book, uh, The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of Creation. It was initially published in 1691. And in this book, he says, here, by the by, I cannot but look upon the strange instinct of this noisome and troublesome creature, the louse. Uh, of searching out foul and nasty clothes to harbor and breed in as an effect of divine providence, designed to deter men and women from sluttishness and sordidness and to provoke them unto cleanliness and neatness. God himself hates uncleanliness and turns away from it. But if God requires and is pleased with bodily cleanliness, much more is he so with the pureness of the mind. So, Ray's explanation for lice is that God wants you to be clean and pure. And so I guess he thinks he gives people lice who are dirty and unclean. I'm not sure how that logic works, but I, I think that's what he says. He definitely sees lice as an effect of divine providence and not evil. So that would be an example of a Christian who is sort of reasoning through suffering and seeing in it God's 
providence. William Paley then, very famous author, wrote Natural Theology, uh, which is sort of a classic book of design. He had a lot to say about natural evil. He says, uh, animals preying upon one another. The only question open to us is whether it be ultimately evil. Immortality upon this earth is out of the question. Without death, there could be no animal happiness. So Paley enjoys a lot of popularity among creationists still today. Uh, sometimes I wonder if they've actually read what he had to say because his position on death here is really different than your average modern creationist. Uh, without death, there could be no animal happiness. So when we look at the natural theology movement and their perspective, exemplified in Ray and Paley, they understand natural evil to serve a good purpose. And even if we can't figure out what that purpose is, even if we can't make up some story about how lice encourages us to be clean, we ought to give God the benefit of the doubt. And Paley explicitly says, without death there is no happiness. And happiness in Paley's system is the greatest thing. God wants us to be happy. And we are happy, for Paley, by doing what God wanted us to do. And if God made us into a rattlesnake that eats mice, then we will be happy when we eat mice. Now, what does the Bible say about this then? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about death. Um, the Bible says, uh, the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Uh, notice here, this translation has this, for when you eat of it, you shall surely die. The literal Hebrew there is beom, which means in the day. Uh, King James has it, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Uh, that is used by anti-creationists to argue that this can't be physical death because in the day they ate it, they didn't actually die. This is a case where the anti-creationist is actually more of a literalist than I am. I understand Baom. The wide usage of Baom in the Old Testament indicates that it has a much broader meaning. It can mean just flat out when. There are other times when it means a specific day. It often says in the same day or in the fourth day or the fifth day. It's modified by a number. But Baom by itself is often just used for when. This translation captures that. I like that. Another verse here where we have death referenced in the Old Testament, Isaiah 25. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. No more death in the coming kingdom. That's pretty significant. Romans 6.23, we read that the wages of sin is death. Adam sinned, Adam died. We sin, we die. The only way out of that, the gift of God, it is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is addressing the sin of Adam. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And finally, at the very end of the Bible, we can read the last, the last part of the story and we find out that death does indeed get thrown into the lake of fire. Death is defeated. Notice, especially in that Corinthians passage there, uh, 1 Corinthians here, death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. He's talking about Adam and Jesus, and he is referring there to physical death, right? Jesus rose from the dead physically, and he is likening that to the death brought about by Adam. So Adam brings physical death, Jesus undoes, undoes that physical death. He makes a way for us to avoid it. So if we had to summarize things here, the story of the Bible, God made humans 
to live in a perfect paradise. They sinned, and God cursed them with death. Jesus paid the death penalty for all sin because he never sinned. God raised him from the dead, and we can now share in that resurrection through faith. Death is not a good thing. The Bible depicts death as, number one, a punishment for sin, and number two, something that will be defeated. Jesus died and rose again to show victory over death, that the punishment for sin has been paid. And death is the enemy that will be destroyed in the end. It seems to me that Paley's position that death is okay, that death is part of creation, that we can't be happy if we don't die, is not really an option that I can accept. It does not seem to me to be consistent with the story of the Bible. That still leaves a really important question. Where do we get things like rattlesnakes? In case you're wondering, yes, I did take this picture. Yes, I did take it with a macro lens. And yes, there is a very nice thick piece of glass between me and Mr. Snake here. So, yeah. Um, some things to note about the rattlesnake. Notice here, he's got this opening here and another opening down here. That is a heat sensing pit. Rattlesnake is a pit viper. He's got this really cool sense organ between his eye and his nostril that allows him to, to detect heat. So he can crawl around in the dark and find all those warm little mousies and gobble them up. He is a heat-seeking mouse killer and squirrel killer if he needs to. The real scary part about the rattlesnake, of course, is that beautiful venom injection system, right? So he's got this gland here that generates uh, venom, and that venom is a cocktail of different proteins that do all sorts of nasty things to your cells. Uh, there's a, a tube running down into its hollow fangs that allow for the snake to open wide the mouth, latch onto the prey, and inject the venom from the gland into the prey. Uh, for something like a mouse or a squirrel, death is pretty close to instantaneous. Uh, the dosage of venom is that strong. For us, it takes a little longer, but it'll kill you too. And that, in some sense, depends on how much of the venom you get in you and whether you actually get help right away and whether you put a tourniquet on or something. Um, so rattlesnakes are scary. And it's really hard to avoid the conclusion that they were designed to hunt and kill. And in fact, not only are they designed to hunt and kill, they're very good at it. So how do we then explain that in creationist terms? If death is the enemy, if death came about as a result of the fall, then why do we have rattlesnakes? Where do rattlesnakes come into this picture? Now let's think again about Paley's response. Paley actually has something to say about this. He says that, first of all, his, his basic philosophical, philosophy idea here is that um, good design reveals a good designer, and that God cares for his creation by providing them with good designs that contribute to their happiness. Remember, for Paley, happiness is the goal of all creation. That's what creation is striving for. They want to be happy. And so God gives each creature what it needs to be happy. Uh, so he gives the rattlesnake fangs and venom injection and heat sensing pits so that he can find prey and eat it and be happy. That's, 
That's, that's what rattlesnakes are for. That's what makes them happy. And that's what God intended. So what about these designs that are clearly linked to natural evil? Well, he says quite clearly, the fangs of vipers, the stings of wasps and scorpions are as clearly intended for their purpose as any animal structure is for any purpose, the most incontestably beneficial. And the same thing must be acknowledged of the talons and beaks of birds, of the tusks and teeth and claw of beasts of prey, and of the shark's mouth, of the spider's web, and of numberless weapons of offense belonging to different tribes of voracious insects. We cannot, have, therefore, avoid the difficulty by saying that the effect was not intended. So remember, Paley is all about making animals happy. If they've got beautiful uh, contrivances that look like they are evidence of design, you can't duck that. It really is designed. Paley, in this case, is right. The curse cannot simply be taking a creation and letting some things die. The curse has got to be more than that. Because when we look around and see how many animals are beautifully designed to kill, then we realize there's really more to this than just letting some things die. So Paley's solution, as we said, we cannot therefore avoid the difficulty by saying that the effect was not intended. The only question open to us, whether it be ultimately evil, we never discover a train of contrivance to bring about an evil purpose. He just says, animals killing other animals, animals killing people is not evil. That is what they're doing to use the designs that God gave them in order to be happy. <coughs> this argument has been raised in the modern ID debate, the intelligent design debate, and Bill Dembski has responded in his book, Intelligent Design. Critics, he says, who invoke the problem of evil against design have left science behind and entered the waters of philosophy and theology. Okay, sure. A torture chamber replete with implements of, sorry, a torture chamber replete with implements of torture is designed, and the evil of its designer does nothing to undercut the torture chamber's design. The existence of design is distinct from the morality, aesthetics, goodness, optimality, or perfection of design. So Dembski wants to argue that certain things are the result of an intelligent design. And so his critics say, well, what do you do with the design of something like a rattlesnake? It's clearly designed. Is this something that God designed to kill people? And Dembski says, that's not really the point. The point is not who is the designer. The point is it's designed. But that seems unsatisfactory to me as a creationist because I have a lot bigger things to think about than just whether a thing is designed. I can look at a rattlesnake and go, yep, totally designed. Amazing design, beautiful. Uh, I need to look beyond that and think about how does this fit into my perspective? So if we had to summarize these two reactions, Paley is, Paley's response is to deny it's not really evil. And even if it is evil, it's for the ultimate good. It makes things happy. Yes, the mouse does not enjoy being eaten by the rattlesnake, but it's quick, it's fast, probably not a whole lot of pain involved because it's so quick. And so, boom, rattlesnake takes it, rattlesnake's happy. Rattlesnake has more happiness than the sadness of the mouse, so there you go. And Dembski's response is kind of an evasion, really. It doesn't change the design argument, and the goodness of the designer is ancillary to the existence of the designer, which philosophically, yeah, that's sure, that's true, but from the larger perspective of trying to understand God's creation, it's rather unsatisfactory. We want to know more than just whether it's designed, but how it fits into God's good designs. So let's think more about this issue of designed evil and the curse. We know God cursed creation. We read about it in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, and we can read all through the scripture, the, 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 the badness of death. Death is a punishment. We believe 
that the curse brought physical death to creation. Uh, and now we can see things, part of that physical death, that seem to be only explainable through design. So why is it that there is design in the curse? <clears throat> well, the reality is death absolutely requires design. Uh, the most obvious issue there is that population control relies on death in our present world. And all organisms, no matter what they are, rely on death. When an animal dies and decomposes, all of those nutrients go back into the soil and are used by plants to grow. Plants are destroyed by animals when they're eaten. Those animals are destroyed by other animals when they're eaten, or they just eventually die of old age and rot and are consumed by decomposers, at which point those nutrients go back into the soil. So our modern ecology is an ecology that depends on death. Th that's not a system where you can just say, maybe animals didn't die in the beginning. That changes the whole thing. The whole thing has to change. So if we're going to imagine a world where there is no, somehow there's no animal death, whether it's all animals or just some animals, I don't know. But if there is a certain segment of animals that don't die, then you really are talking about a completely different ecology than the one we live in now. So some examples of this. We can look at Isle Royal. Uh, this is Isle Royale. This is where it's located. It's about 50 miles from the Keweenaw Peninsula. Uh, and it's pretty long there. It's about 10 miles from Canada in Lake Superior. There's the mitten of Michigan and the upper peninsula of Michigan. Uh, it's about a three-hour boat ride. And if you're lucky, you'll be, have a smooth boat ride and you won't end up totally seasick when you get there. Not everybody is so lucky. Um, at the end of the 19th century, as the ecology of uh, that part of the world was changing, the caribou had finally moved on, the reindeer had finally moved on, and uh, moose had begun to settle into this area. And uh, moose swam over the 10 miles from Canada to Isle Royale uh, and colonized the island at the end of the 19th century. Moose are pretty strong swimmers, as it turns out. Uh, that was followed by pretty wild fluctuations in the moose population. Uh, increased dramatically at the first, at the beginning, and then they crashed, and then they increased again. Uh, then in 1940, there was an extremely bitter winter, and Lake Superior froze all the way from Canada to uh, Isle Royale, which allowed for a pack of wolves to relocate where they found some nice, juicy moose waiting for them. And you can imagine what happens next. 1959, ecologists began monitoring the moose population on Isle Royale with a census every year. You can see the population fluctuations here from 1959 all the way to 2011. Uh, currently, the moose are on a bit of an upswing in the most recent six years of data. When we add the wolf population onto that, we can see something really interesting. Places where the wolves have high population density, the wolf numbers are over here, they never reach much more than 50 uh, compared to 2,500 moose. But where the wolf population reaches high density, the moose population is crashing. And when the moose population gets really large, the wolf population is low, but then starts to recover. And eventually then, when the, moose, when the wolf population hits its maximum, uh, the moose population begins to decline. Uh, what we're seeing here is the basics of predator-prey dynamics. When um, prey numbers increase, and the predator numbers increase shortly thereafter, because there's more prey, there's more stuff to eat. Uh, when that happens, of course, prey numbers begin to go down because they're getting eaten, right? And then that causes the predator numbers to go down as well, 
because uh, there's less prey around. And so then the prey can recover because there are fewer predators eating them. Uh, we can see this cycle also in a classic example uh, from the Hudson Bay Company. They kept careful records of uh, lynx and snowshoe hair pelts uh, for decades. And the number of pelts is kind of like a sample of the population size. Uh, and this is, the, this is the data from that. And you can see here, there's an offset. The predator is shown in orange, and his peaks are always slightly later than the peaks of the prey. Uh, so that when the prey is at maximum, the predators are starting to recover. And once the predators reach their maximum, the prey numbers begin to go down again. So those give you a sense of why this is important. Without predators, we would be overrun with vermin in a very short amount of time. And in our modern world, predators are a good thing. They help to control populations of other animals, prey animals. And is it even possible for us to have a world without them? So death controls population sizes, death recycles nutrients, and we're going to need some other method of doing those things if we don't have death. Simple example here, uh, loggerhead turtles. These are type 3 survivors. That means, uh, generally speaking, mortality is highest at young ages. So we have a very high mortality rate when they're very young and it goes down gradually as they get older. So that the oldest members of the population are in fact the fewest in number. But if you imagine a loggerhead turtle doing what it usually does, producing enormous numbers of eggs, you've all seen those nature shows where turtles crawl up on the beach and lay giant pits of eggs. Uh, imagine if all of those survived. Uh, in just 10 generations, the world would be overrun with 900 quadrillion sea turtles. Obviously, not a real sustainable situation. So death is important. That should say the pre-fall world. Oh, well, the pre-fall world, absent of death, must have been completely different from what we have today. So we see around us today degenerative changes, things that we think of as degeneration, emerging diseases and invasive species and high extinction rates. And we think about how creation is gradually, slowly falling apart. And that's true. That's a result of the curse. But that's not the whole story of the curse. We have to remember that the curse involves um, design as well. Now, are there any clues then to what the world was like before the fall? Well, this is where it gets really, 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 really dicey. I'm not sure there are, but let me throw out an interesting observation, a, a, a guess, really. This is just a guess. Just between you and me, we won't tell anybody else. We'll just, this is my guess. This is an upside down jellyfish. Cassiopeia samachana. Most jellyfish, you know, they float around in the ocean, they drag their tentacles beneath them, and the tentacles have little stingers on them called nematocysts, and when they brush up against a fish, then the stingers shoot into the fish and stun it, and, and, and there's usually toxins involved, and then it can drag the fish up to its mouth and consume it. And if you've ever stepped on a jellyfish at the beach, you know, it can be pretty nasty and unpleasant. You don't want to do that. Well, Zamachana here is a little different. It's an upside down jellyfish. So instead of floating around, it, it's able to, to lay on the bottom of the ocean with its tentacles sticking up. And those tentacles contain zooxanthellae, which are symbiotic algae. Uh, they have sibiodinium algae living in their tentacles. And the sting then of this jellyfish is extremely mild. 
probably wouldn't even notice it. Some people report some mild itching when they touch a, one of these things, but it's not something most people uh, notice. Now, there's still predators on very small creatures. Their, 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 their nematocysts can still fire and cause pain. But I really find it interesting that this, this creature that is capable of forming this symbiosis with this algae that provides nutrients to the jellyfish happens to be with a jellyfish that has very, very weak stingers. Is this a model of what the world might have been like before the fall, where predators had very different ecological relationships? Relationships that did not reestablish themselves either after the fall or after the flood. Is it possible that this upside down jellyfish might give us a hint that before the fall, there were these interesting symbiotic relationships which would have provided food and nutrients to these predators in ways that we can't even imagine today? Again, this is speculation, it is a guess. I don't know. I'm not a big jellyfish expert. I just find it really intriguing that you can take a jellyfish and make it a symbiote with this algae that feeds it, and suddenly it's not really all that stingy anymore. That's kind of cool. So, uh, conclusions here. Physical death is a result of the curse. Um, looking through the scripture, it's hard for me to avoid that conclusion. Physical death appears to be something that's brought about by the curse. Uh, the whole sweep of scripture, the story of salvation and redemption, seems to be focused on undoing the curse of death. But, as a biologist, I look around and I can see that death is absolutely part of the design of this ecology. This ecology that we live in now is dependent upon death to cycle nutrients through the ecosystem. So that leads me to conclude that death must have been part of some sort of redesign at the curse. If we're just thinking of the curse as, boom, now you die, where before you didn't, we're not really doing justice to the curse. If, if the curse involves a lack of animal death prior to the curse, then we're looking at a world that is almost unimaginable. And maybe green jellyfish, upside down jellyfish, can give us a clue of what that might look like, but maybe not. And that is that. Thank you for listening.